Hello everybody, my name is Henk de Berg. I'm a professor at the University of Sheffield and the director of the Prokhorov Center. I'm here in the Humanities Research Institute at the University of Sheffield to interview Peter Pomerantsev. Peter, welcome to Sheffield and to the Prokhorov Center. It's uh, my pleasure. Peter, you are the author of two best-selling books, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which uh, explores the new post-Soviet Russia and a book which came out last year, This is Not Propaganda, which looks at issues of information manipulation, disinformation, political propaganda, and so on. I want to look at some of the questions that you raise in these books, but before that, let's have a quick look at your biography, because I think your, your, your background is linked to the country that you look at most in these two books, which is Russia, or perhaps in the case of your background, I should say, the Soviet Union or Ukraine. Tell us a little bit about your, um, your biography. Sure. I was, um, I was born in, in 1977 in a country that doesn't exist anymore, in the Soviet Union, uh, in, in Kiev. Uh, but all I really had time to do um, before my parents were exiled from the Soviet Union was throw up on it. So I threw up on it, I was born, I threw up on it, and then we left, basically. Which, which um, I don't know if that's kind of decisive for my relationship with the Soviet Union, but, but that kind of was it, really. Uh, so when I was nine months old, my parents were exiled. They were dissidents, and at that time, um, after you'd been sort of arrested by the KGB, as they were, for the heinous crime of, sort of reading books, basically, uh, they had copies of censored literature. Um, at that time, sort of, you know, it was quite sort of the soft-ish, sclerotic-ish period of the Soviet Union where the policy was to let's just get dissidents out of the country. Uh, don't let them become martyrs, just throw them out. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other factors which contributed to that being the policy that was taken towards them. They were in Kiev, but they weren't Ukrainian nationalists, they were kind of Russian Jewish. So again, that kind of, uh, the KGB was much softer on, on sort of Russian speakers than it was on Ukrainian speakers. So, so they were exiled in kind of a small wave of immigration in the late 70s. Um, and, and through a series of adventures, they ended up in London. Uh, when well, my father worked for the BBC, I'm very much child of the BBC World Service. It's the reason I have this strange English accent. I'm very accidentally British, um, and it's a very thin kind of association I have with Britain, um, which is all, all through the BBC, really. So I grew up as a World Service kid. I grew up, all my earliest memories are wandering around the BBC World Service, uh, which was then Bush House. It's huge, beautiful, kind of vast ship of a building where all these different nationalities inside of it, uh, all speaking different languages, but all united in their Britishness by, by the BBC. Um, and so I ended up going to school in London, and then my father moved from the BBC to Radio Free Europe, which was sort of the much more kind of politically aggressive American international mm -hmm. broadcaster, and he moved to Munich. Uh, spent a couple of years in Munich, um, uh, went to a German gymnasium for a bit, and then something called the European School, which is a special type of school designed by the European Union to create little Europeans, and I explore that in this book. It was a, sort of a, an exercise in creating um, a European identity. It was meant largely for the children of Euro EU bureaucrats, but a lot of, sort of expat kids went there as well. So that was very interesting, and I have a lot about that in my new book. Um, uh, and then from there, I came back to London, you know, went to university in Scotland. Um, so, so largely a Western European and British, British childhood. And then, and then I did something rather nuts. I went, I went to, well, not nuts, I mean, just slightly different. I, I, went, to, I went to Moscow after university and spent... This, this was in 2001, Yeah, this it? was actually, just, I arrived there like two weeks just after September the 11th. Uh, there were still flight bans and stuff. And, and if you think about September the 11th, that was this moment for all its many horrors. That was the moment when you know, Condoleezza Rice said, that's when the Cold War ended, really, because Putin called Bush and yeah. sort of offered support. And, and, and really, I was, I was, I was uh, you know, my first job in Russia was working at a think tank, where, and, then, and then I went on, to, I found that a little bit boring, so I went to film school there and started working on documentaries about Russia, but, but very much caught up in the romance of the idea that, you know, this is Russia emerging from a century of horror to join the West. And, you know, Russia seemed to be becoming democratic. There were parties and, you know, there were different, um, there, were sort of, there were parties as in fun parties, because it was a golden age, but as in political parties as well. 
Um, and and um, they had all the veneer of democracy, elections and parties and different media and, and this incredible kind of vivaciousness in business um, and, and Moscow was just booming. Uh, so all, all the sort of theory of, of democratic change, you know, you know, private business plus um, rights seem to be coming together. That's what it seemed like to me. I'd say right from my arrival, my Russian friends were saying, are you mad? This country can only ever be a dictatorship and a bunch of KGB killers have taken over. I was still very naive. I suppose I was still young. Um, but gradually, you know, I began to notice how weird this new political system was, that it seemed like a democracy, but, but really wasn't. Once you yeah. started to get, to get uh, to and it. that's one of the things that you focus about in, in the book, yeah. uh, because you, you write about a whole range of issues. You write about supermodels, you write about uh, professional criminals, you write, you write about television entertainment. I think you were uh, there between 2001 and 2010, partly working in television mm -hmm. as a television uh, producer, but you also you will also talk about politics and and political propaganda. And one of the uh, things you say is, um, you know, looking at this new Russia, everything is PR, and politics is really one big reality show, which is kind of a continuation of a dictatorship, but with different means. Explain what you mean when you say everything is PR and politics was really one big reality. TV show because the other thing you say about this, which I think is very interesting and which we will uh, explore later on, is that in many ways this was a precursor to what we see to some extent to what we see now, especially in the United States, but maybe to uh, to an extent also in the UK. So talk about Russia and politics and propaganda and reality TV shows. So you're quite right. I worked in TV. I was working in entertainment TV then, um, so I didn't really touch the news. Um, I worked for a, a channel that just did entertainment, but I did come in contact with sort of the class of uh, Russian producers, TV producers, and PR people, and you know the people who invent or see themselves as inventing meanings in this society um, a lot. Um, and and yeah, that was kind of a, a buzzword that they all had. The show PR, everything is PR. You know all the stuff we see in the West. It's all, it's, all, it's all surface, it's all like, uh, uh, democracy is just a, a, a charade. Uh, there are no real values behind it. And, and that's definitely what they would say about their own system as well, that it's all just PR. Uh, there was an a, 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 a sort of obsession with, with, with PR as a, as, as a profession, as being the most important one. Um, political technologists, which is the Russian term for spin doctors, but which has within this, kind of implicit within it, this kind of idea of engineers of human souls, mm -hmm. echoing in there, which is an old Soviet phrase. About about the arts, um, uh, they, they were kind of like the you know one of the most prestigious classes in 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 in, in the political system. Um, it's what the clever people wanted to be, um, and uh, yeah, it was kind of a very deeply deeply cynical philosophy, where democracy is a sham in the West and it's a sham in Russia as well. But that's normal and that's fine, and and that's just the way things are. Um, and, you know, I'd obviously complain to them going, no, you know, the West is actually built on values and competition. They sort of laugh at me and say, no, it's ruled over by a political class. It just exchanges kind of like, exchanges, uh, exchanges power between itself and it's all a joke. Um, which was also used, you know, very cynically as a way to legitimize sort of the increasing control of the Kremlin over all forms of media and, yeah. and politics. Because it sounds like sort of a, a three-stage development that you're describing. So if people uh, protest, if they don't agree with the government, one of the things you can do is you, you can throw them in jail or send them off to the gulag or whatever. That's hap what's happened in Stalinist Russia. Another way of dealing, sort of a next stage, would be to say, um, to, um, to use what um, Herbert Marcuse has called repressive tolerance. In other words, you give people freedom of expression, but then basically uh, that's just a safety valve, a way for people to let off steam, and then, and then you ignore them, uh, which is what Marcuse is saying about, Marcuse writing in the 1960s, is saying about liberal, uh, liberal democracy. But then you seem to be talking about sort of a third stage where um, politics becomes merged with entertainment to such a degree that the whole concept of truth seems to disappear. Uh, but also then even um, 
even, op even the opposition, so even critique and protest cannot escape the pull from sort of escapism and the entertainment industry so that everything becomes one big unreality, as it were. And then that, in addition, is used by the government, the Russian government, but then later also maybe other governments, uh, to sort of uh, co-opt, inhabit every possible kind of counterculture so that um, the government would then um, support to some, uh, sometimes even financially support, subsidize various kind of countercultures. But then, of course, if everything is inhabited by the government, if the government is in everything, then there's no real counterculture left. So what the philosopher Jürgen Habermas has called bürgerliche Öffentlichkeit, a public sphere, then really becomes reduced to the government sphere because the government is in everything. Is that sort of a, a fair sum? Is, do, you, do you see the same kind of development? Yeah, but um, uh, with the added um, dimension that this is done openly. Mm -hmm. It is not hidden. It's not like disguised that all the political parties are actually controlled by the Kremlin. It's, it's actually, the Kremlin, if anything, is openly manipulating and underlining its own powers of control and manipulation in order to, A, sort of disincentivize people, sort of say, look, we're everywhere. You think there's an opposition, we're everywhere. You know, where we have control over all of this charade. Don't even think about uh, stepping outside of it. You could inhabit it, and there are certain rules if you do, but this is the game and these are the contours of it. And I think also in a kind of like more subtle way, kind of saying, look, if we can manipulate our elections, our parties, our media, then the same thing's happening over there in the West. Kind of like, we do it, therefore they do it. Kind of, undermining the idea that something autonomous is even possible in a very kind of subtle way. Um, that's, that's what it, it could be very, that was the weirdness of living in that system. Nobody was hiding the fact that all the political parties that were allowed to compete uh, were, actually, were actually kind of taking their diktat from the Kremlin. The excuse for that was that we need managed democracy, and this is what it was called. In the 1990s were chaos, when we had real competition, Russia isn't ready for this, so therefore we need this. That was kind of the excuse that was given to Westerners and, and to, in certain bits of the liberal conversation. That really wasn't kind of the effect. Um, but uh, that was what was, was quite hard to explain to people sometimes, because they were like, oh, they're trying to con the population. They're, they're not trying to con anyone, quite the opposite. They're showing very openly that they're in charge. But by, by showing it, then they're also presumably making the people completely cynical because you've still got to work within the system to some degree. I mean, not all Russians can emigrate. Yeah. Um, so you're there, you're doing your thing, and to some extent you think, oh, I'm part of an opposition party or I'm some sort of counterculture or I'm protesting against the government. So maybe on some level I'm doing some good things. But at the same time, you know, it's kind of all... Sort of, it's always kind of recovered by 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 the system. So, so, so the way that sort of like one of the propagandists of the Putin system um, explained it to me, there really is only one message in all of this: that there is no alternative to Putin. That whatever you do, it'll it's still all part of the greater Putin. Uh, I just constantly reaffirm that. And again, their argument would be in the 1990s, the Kremlin was very weak, power was very weak, and so they had to constantly create after 2000, this sort of, the sense that it's everywhere. So that, everything is geared towards that, to restore the sense that the Kremlin is everywhere and to restore, uh, or to, and, and to sort of really sort of drill down into this idea that, that there is no alternative to Putin, that all roads lead to Putin. Um, again, that's how they explain its sort of evolution and where it came from. Um, so, so, so in that sense, they're very interested, even when they don't control something, to making it look as if they control it. Uh, which, can, which, which would lead to some quite absurd things. You link the development that you've just described and other thinkers do as well to the end of the Cold War and the demise of clear and convincing ideologies after the Cold War. So can you say a little bit more about that? Well, that's really sort of very much the territory of, of, of my second book as well, but, but partly my first. Um, it very, very simply, and returning to propaganda, which is really, and media, which is really my beat. I'm not a political scientist. Um, you know, the Soviet Union would try to impose a right version of history and a right idea of, of ideology on people, very, very 
crassly by the end, in a very uninspiring way. Um, Putin doesn't really have an ideology. I mean, come back to, I, I actually think he is uh, a populist, not in the sense that he's against the elites, but in the sense that he's constructing an idea of the people on this kind of ideological and sociological wasteland. Um, so, um, so that becomes the main idea, constructing the people, what actually in, in Russia it's called the Bolshinstvo, the Putinskaya Bolshinstvo, which is this idea that Putin represents the majority. The majority is constantly being redefined, the minority is constantly being redefined, it's kind of a, a blob that has to be filled with very different meanings. Um, but that becomes the idea, and that can be left, right, atheist, uh, orthodox, that's constantly moving like, a, like, like one of these sort of hologrammatic balls that's constantly changing colour. Um, and in order to survive and flourish in the system, it actually does not help to be ideological. It helps to be able to transform yourself um, to being kind of, you know, a nostalgic communist in the morning, to being kind of a, a business-loving globalist at lunchtime, and then being a kind of orthodox nationalist in the afternoon. And, and, and you think about the elites who've prospered, they, they, they have this ability to completely transform themselves, um, often within one sentence. Um, I, I, I think the search for sort of a stable ideological meaning inside Putinism um, kind of misses the point. Uh, they can do an ideology for a couple of hours if they need to, uh, but, but, but they can never maintain it and they don't want to maintain it. Um, so the idea also being that after the Cold War, mm. all these ideologies are basically dead, mm. so that you can, okay, communism predicted a glorious future and that didn't happen, but then capitalism or liberal democracy also predicted a, a, a brilliant f future. And now that the Soviet Union has fallen away as the enemy, you can see some sort of unfettered, globalized capitalism, which you know, doesn't seem to be that great either. Mm -hmm. So that the, the situation we're in, or rather this is the question, uh, the atmosphere or the cultural atmosphere we're in is really one of sort of nihilism and complete relativism. It makes no difference which ideology you inhabit uh, or adhere to. You can change your ideologies like, like clothes. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's a lot of that. I mean, I think it's important to understand this word cynicism and nihilism. I think they're very different things. Um, nihilism is actually quite idealistic. It, you know, think about the sort of the nihilists in, in Russian novels in the 19th century. They have an ideology. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's kind of a black hole ideology, but they, they, they actually believe in nothing in a very powerful way. Cynicism is something else, and, and uh, certainly the way that I use it in, the, in, in, in my first book, uh, but also the way I've seen it sort of discussed, I think, by sort of like literary critics like Levinson, I think, in Russia, who's written a lot about Russian cynicism. It's the ability to, to play different roles. You know, you do this in one morning and this in another morning, and then you have do something with the right hand, nothing with the left hand. Cynicism is, is sort of... Sounds a bit like Marx's definition of the realm of freedom. You can go fishing in the morning and then critiquing in the afternoon. Well, or so. pantheism. I was about you, you, you pray at the Temple of Diana in the morning and then the Temple of Zeus in the afternoon. Or, or maybe the most useful one is Terminator 2. So the Soviet Union was Terminator 1, you know, it sort of had very, it was very like Arnie, it was, had one face and it was robotic. And, and Putinism is Terminator 2, where it's constantly transforming into any role that it needs for that specific moment. With, with some overarching, um, overarching kind of aims, like being powerful, um, which we can discuss why and what that means in Russia. But, so, so, so that I, I would actually, nihilism, and, nihilism is quite romantic, you know, nihil, you know punks are quite romantic. Uh, in, the, in their own kind of way. This, this is not that. This is, you know, a cynic can be nihilistic in the morning and then idealistic in the afternoon. That's, that's the trick. Um, and then move on to something else again. So it's that liquid nature um, of identity that, that is, is really the, you know, is the secret, but also just think about it. The people who manage to survive the rambunctious and chaotic changes in Russia over the last 30 years. Think of all the roles they've inhabited over those 30 <laughs> years, and then starting right at the start in the late 1970s when they were feigning a communism that nobody believed in. So right at the start, there is no kind of moment of belief in something. They were already born into a system where you had kind of double or triple or quadruple identities. So, so there was not, there's not even a starting point of idealism that you can go back to. I mean, it's very, very important to understand that people who are in charge of Russia now, they kind of grew, matured in the, in the 70s. The people who led Perestroika matured in the 60s, which was a time of maybe the last wave of communist utopian thinking. 
sort of cognizant association with the human face that sort of dies in 68 mm -hmm. in, in the invasion of Prague. But, it, you know, there's been very good think of the Soviet films then and the Soviet science program. And there is this, this is the last kind of burst of some sort of veneer of genuine optimism. So the people who grow up then are the people who then lead Perestroika. So they're still believers. The Putin generation is very different. They grew up in the 70s and complete and utter cynicism. And they're the ones in charge now and who are not letting go. What makes me hopeful about Russia is at one point, the people who grew up in 89 to 91, they need to come into power. And there, they have much, they have a memory of an idealism in them because there was a genuine idealistic moment between 89 and 93, basically, which dies, I think, in 93 for various reasons. So, so that's, one could look at Russia in terms of these generations of cynicism and idealism. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I haven't quite abandoned hope, but yeah, no, that, it may that, be too late. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. So uh, that's Russia. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, you, you say, uh, you know, maybe that's a precursor of what we're experiencing currently in the West. I think the, in your second book, one of the chapters is called The Future Arrived First in, uh, in, in, in Russia. But let's come back to, to that in a moment. I want to now turn to your second book, where you also talk about some of these issues, but with a much stronger focus on propaganda, and especially the, the role of the internet and social media in, in propaganda. And you start off this second book, This Is Not Propaganda, uh, Interestingly enough, in the Philippines, uh, and you look at a guy whom you designate with the letter P, uh, and who played or claimed that he played an important role in the election of Rodrigo Duterte as president, and of course Duterte is still the president of the uh, Philippines. Um, tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about P and, and, and what he did uh, with social media. So he's a, yeah, he's a, he's a digital, um, digital propagandist who, who came from um, actually, his evolution is very interesting because it sort of reflects the evolution of, of, of sort of um, spin on social media. I mean, he started off just as a teenager still, um, creating these kind of very, very popular Facebook groups uh, where people just talk about their emotions, largely. Mm -hmm. Now, Philippines, very interesting. There's a reason I, two reasons I started in the Philippines. One, it went through its own pro-democracy movement in sort of the mid-1980s, which echoes the pro-democracy movements of, of Eastern Europe. Uh, I think we sometimes forget that actually 1989, that sort of big wave of democratization wasn't just about Eastern Europe, it was about Latin America and South Asia as well. So, so I had this big moment of hope, which is now sort of falling apart. But also, to do with propaganda, it's got the highest, or these figures fluctuate, but at the time of writing, it had the highest amount of um, users of social media per capita. So it's very, very sort of digitized, very, very internet penetrated and very social media penetrated mm -hmm. society uh, for many, many reasons uh, that we can get into, but it means that Facebook plays a huge role in it. Uh, I think even when you buy your phone, Facebook is like hardwired in as your interface. So it's, 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 it plays a role much bigger than, than, than in Britain. So yeah, he started off doing these Facebook groups, uh, which became super popular, all about, all about emotion and confession and it's a very expressive culture, the Philippines. Um, and, and so that kind of stuff grew very, very popular. We talk about your feelings, your emotions. And, and for the first people to approach him were like people who were like, you know, selling mobile phones, uh, saying, look, can you start mentioning how great our phones are? And, you know, they'd pay him in mobile phones. And you're still, uh, you're still in school at that point. Uh, then these kind of commercial offers became more sophisticated. So people were like, okay, can you start pushing your, our medicines on your on Facebook groups? Uh, and there he was more subtle. And by then I think he was already in college and studying, I think he was studying psychology. Um, and he was like, okay, so he'd, he'd, he'd do a really sad theme, like talking about death and the death of loved ones. And can people talk about, you know, how hard it was losing um, those nearest and dearest to them, how they got over those experiences. And then he'd drop in an ad about, wow, there's this great medicine out there. Yeah. So he was already thinking very much about how does he curate desire. In a way, it's, you know, it's basic marketing theory, you know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, um, evoking a desire for something among people that they didn't never occur to them they wanted. But, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see how it's done in the social media space where, you know, there's no barriers between, there's no kind of official sort of like, you know, designation of advertising and it's a much more emotionally intimate community. Yeah, it's kind of slipped in, it, it's yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not like an advertising hoarding, it's, it's really yeah. like within, within, within the conversation and in a very kind of private place for people or very emotional place. 
Um, and then he was like, okay. And by this time he'd made a bunch of money. Um, and, and as an ambitious young man, he wanted to try out politics. And, and um, also kind of a new market for him. Um, uh, so Philippines is interesting because it has genuinely competitive elections. So there's a big financial market for, um, for political propaganda. And he ended up, yeah, sort of wedded to the Duterte campaign where Duterte at that point, he's now the president of the Philippines. At that point, he was like a sort of a very crass talking, famously violent mayor in the south of the country who was really well known just for one thing, which was um, dealing with drug crime, essentially by killing anyone suspected of being associated with the drug trade, sometimes the vigilante gangs. Um, but in order to make this complete outsider more popular, um, the mission was to make his one agenda more kind of more relevant to more people. Um, now there is a problem with, with drug crime in in the Philippines. Actually, there's a problem with crime full stop. But the idea was kind of wed crime and drug crime together. Mm -hmm. So yes. this guy who campaigns against drug crime would be you know create a demand for him. Uh, and again, to what, what this guy, P, who asked me not to use his name, uh, told me, was um, described to me, was sort of how he set up sort of Facebook groups in different cities, which just for a long time, way in advance of the elections, so many months before the elections, uh, which just talked about local issues in the cities. So, you know, what's on, you know, chit chat, latest news. And they were quite popular. He said the secret was doing it in the local dialects because the Philippines, the country, has got, got an official... Di dialects. Actually, every island has got its own dialect. So make it as local as possible. That will make people trust you. Build that up quite slowly. And then he had these, he, the administrators would start dropping in stories about crime. They were real stories about crime. But here was the twist. In the comments section, they were going, actually, this is a drug crime, but nobody wants to talk about it. Uh, and just get this feeling going that drug crime is everywhere, that it's a huge issue. Um, look, there's many ways that drug crime was pushed to the forefront of the national debate. And like the problem with interviewing any of these people, from Putin's big doctor to this yeah, you guy. Sure they're guy. always overrated or course, overstate they're always, their own importance. They're always propagandizing themselves. Yes. They're always speaking, you know, talking up their role. But, you know, you see, I mean, the key is you interview lots of people and then you try to get a picture out of it. Sure. I mean, there's, there's, I have no regression analysis sort of tools that I can use to prove exactly how much this side did. Um, but you get a sense of the whole campaign. And what is true, without a doubt, is that, that Duterte was the first social media campaign. I mean, it was partly because he was an outsider, partly because he didn't have big budgets. He, he wasn't even sort of invited onto TV debates at the start. So all his momentum came through social media. And in that sense, it was, it was a very original campaign. And using things that I've talked about, but also looking a lot, using a lot of what, what they claim are sort of just like bottom-up enthusiasts, but you know, one suspects yeah. were maybe paid for or troll farms, sort of to push him all the time. Yeah. Um, so this was one guy doing this, or there were other people doing it as well, of course. Huge, but the one same of one of many, the, and they would have had many, many, many approaches. Yeah, uh, but the same can be done at, at a much larger scale at the so-called at a so-called troll farm. To, what explain to me what a troll well, farm is, or is that slightly different? Mm, well, no, it can do that as well. But the whole idea of a troll farm in um, so in the Philippines, um, and here I actually reference the work of a fantastic academic, one who's at the University of Leeds, the other one who's in. Michigan, I think, or Massachusetts. So embarrassed, I can't remember which one. Anyway, but, but they did this fantastic study over several years what they call the disinformation architecture in the Philippines. Uh, and they describe it right from the top to the bottom. So I talked to like a mid-range operator. They, they talked to the whole kind of scale. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're talking about is activity sort of right at the bottom, like creating lots and lots of avatars on social media that praise a candidate or smear a candidate. So that, that's slightly different to what my guy was doing. He was creating social media communities where the administrators were meant to be, um, uh, were meant to be kind of like steering the conversation. Um, I'm sure he could have done work with a troll farm that would get people to comment. But but um, but is a is a troll farm not also just a, a whole bunch of people located in one building? Yeah, exactly. Doing exactly, doing exactly. sort exactly. of similar stuff at a, at a, you know, in a, in a group. So the way it's described to me, uh, again, there are different types, um, but, but the way in the Philippines, they, they, all, they actually call them call centers, which is just the phrase they use for them, because uh, they look like a call center. Um, and the way it was described to me is sort of, um, you know, 
they pay by the hour, so people can just come in, do a few hour shifts, and then go away again. A lot of some, a lot of people sort of in the gig economy use it. A lot of students, a lot of nurses. So people just come in for a few hours. They they're given kind of an aim, create a hundred accounts, which are all meant to slag off a candidate, and and that's what you have to do. Um, so they can be paid for, or they can be official part of campaigns. They're kind of the, the backdoor of the campaign, or which is what these guys whose whose disinformation architecture. Uh, study I, I quote talked about. I mean, they're, they're often just like PR companies, but who have a kind of a second, slightly shadier sideline sideline in these kind of like covert campaigns. Yeah. So, so there's different types. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's look at some 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 sort of strategies because I think that's useful, especially for people like me who are not very technologically gifted. Uh, you dis distinguish between bots and cyborgs and sock <laughs> puppets. Yes. Explain to me what. Bots and cyborgs and sock puppets yeah, are and what actually, they do. So, okay, yeah, there, there is this whole kind of um, vocabulary that's developing around this, which often gets confused in the, in, in the mainstream press. Um, though I think it's changing now. I think people are, are, are starting to understand much more how it works. So bots are actually just automated accounts, usually quite stupid ones that you program, you know, a thousand Twitter accounts, which are all fake, to say the same thing over and over again. So you could say they're the kind of the most primitive, you know, the most primitive ones, and usually they're really easy to spot because they're all saying the same thing at the same time. Now, bots are actually getting a lot more sophisticated, but we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, then there's the things like chatbots, you know, which we, we all know from any kind of interaction with, with a corporation. When you have a complaint, you'll have some, some, a computer answer you. So it's any kind of purely automated account. Uh, then you have trolls at the other end, which are actually people who are manually controlling an account, but just hiding behind an avatar, or often controlling hundreds of them. So they're writing lots and lots of comments. So that's, that's a human-controlled fake one. And in the middle, you have actually what most are nowadays, which is a cyborg, which is a real person that will have a lot of bots that are, will first... Dispatch. Yeah, like do messages en masse. But if they see somebody engaging with them, yeah. So, for example, during the U.S. campaign, you know, there was these great moments when Michael Flynn, about, you know, President Trump's, I think he was his chief no, of staff, for National example. National security advisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but also, like, like, he was quite important in the campaign as well, even before yeah, he was he later. Was, yeah. uh, he started interacting with a, with a Russian, whatever, uh, a Russian account, which is a fake account. Uh, and at that moment of interaction, a real person will step in and start guiding the conversation. So it's a bot until it gets interaction, and then a real person steps in. So it's a mix. Um, and actually, virtually everything now is, is some sort of cyborg. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are sock puppets. I don't even know where the word comes A sock from. puppet is just a way of saying something that, that, that's using a fake, uh, a fake identity. OK, where does the word come from? Why it's called sock puppet? I think it's finger puppet, isn't it? Uh, oh, right, that's the idea. It's like yeah. sock puppet. I think that's uh, what it is. OK, and let's look at one more general term, uh, dark advertising. What's that? Well, that is um, um, a much more sort of serious and systemic thing, which, which, um, which is basically ads targeted online at people where it's not clear who sent them, um, it's not clear why a person's been targeted, and other people can't really see what's being sent to them. And that's become, you know, quite a, uh, quite a prevalent. Is quite that prevalent another technology. word for micro-targeting then? Well, micro dark ads are usually micro-targeted, but, but, but also they have this kind of uh, association of, um, you know, you can't really tell, there's a lack of transparency around them. So you can micro-target someone transparently, but I think dark ads, is, the idea is that we don't know who else is seeing the ad? And, and I think it's implied you don't usually understand, you don't necessarily understand who's behind them. Um, though, if you're going to get very detailed, that might not be yeah, the okay. only definition of a dark ad. Okay. But so, in, yeah. the, in the case of micro targeting, then you can, uh, you know, try and do what um, lots of politicians try and do, which is to try and be sort of uh, all things to all people, and then you target different groups, but with different messages. That I right? think that's that's definitely. The, I mean, there's always been micro targeting. You know, sort of. You know, when people were doing targeted leafleting somewhere, but but you can do it at scale now. You can do it yeah. very very uh, at scale. Repeat I was going it. to ask you precisely yeah. about that because if you look at these developments, there seem to be sort of you know there seem to be going on all over the place. So all nations are uh, engaged in this, which is not a kind of relativism. I'm sure some nations are worse than others, but they're all kind of engaged in this. They all do it. Um, 
But I wonder whether there's been, with the advent of the internet and social media, a, quite, a kind of what you know, old Marxists uh, used to uh, uh, call a, uh, an umschlagen from the quantitative in the quality. In other words, you've got a qualitative jump, uh -huh. a kind of tipping point where things become qualitatively different. Do mm -hmm. you think that the internet and social media have generated that mm -hmm. qualitative change when it comes to disinformation? Yeah, I mean, it's even tempting, and I kind of play with this in the book to see the whole of our, um, all these kind of like, you know, all these trends that we're seeing across the world actually being summoned up by, by the media structure. So there's, firstly, I mean, if you're a, uh, if you're a politician today and, you know, your main way of reaching people is going to be social media, which increasingly it is. I mean, there was this tipping point when the ad spend on that became bigger than sort of television ads. And if that's going to be what you're going to be doing, then the logic of that is going to be different messages to different people and in the middle of very fuzzy emotion take back control. So I interview the head of the digital Brexit campaign in the book and, and he thinks you need 50 to 70 messages for a country of 30 million. So, and... Uh, and yeah, you want to be as fuzzy as you want in the middle, as funny as, as fuzzy as possible, because you're, I mean, Brexit was saying the most successful ad they did was about um, animal rights. Successful yeah. as in it got people out to vote. So that has nothing to do with immigration or NHS. Yeah. So you have to sort of tie the Explain EU that a bit more, because I read it in a book, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. So these were people yeah. making propaganda for Brexit, yeah. and they were targeting people who were interested in animal rights. Yeah, so the, the job and, is... So explain the link to me. Well, they had, well, there isn't one, naturally. So you have to. That your job is to find what people care about and then tie your cause to what they care about. I mean, it's, it's, it's a marketing approach in that sense. But uh, So you suggest, for example, that the European Union is against animal rights. Is that yeah, because it, it supports... So I think their main lines where it's, the EU supports farmers who raise bulls for bullfighting and the EU transports animals across... has regulations which force... Uh, people who are going to slaughter animals to transport them vast distances because they have to be slaughtered at the place they're going to be packaged. Which does mean that, I mean, it's true, you do have to then transport animals over vast distances, which is in often not the nicest conditions. So, so you take that. Um, so what he, by the way, what he means by successfully means add to going to vote ratio. Yeah? I mean, that doesn't mean it was the most important thing in Brexit. That was, you know, that's probably being weaned on a misinterpretation of Henry V at school. I still think it's by far away the, the biggest the biggest cause of Brexit, uh, we're kind of mis misreadings of Shakespeare. But, I mean, there are much deeper reasons, I'm trying to say. Uh, but still, but, because the margin was so small, yeah, obviously, you that talk does about make you, a, Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe. I mean, you'd have to do vast analysis to try to work that out. But, but he's talking about it from a, from a very practical point of view. Like, you know, he sends the ads, he has a very good idea about who goes and votes afterwards, so he can sort of tell the dynamic. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? So, yes, so... But getting to the point, back to the point, to the sense that the, the, the technology inspires a certain type of politics. So you want something that's very, very fuzzy in the middle, take back control, very, very vague, uh, and then specifically target very, very different groups. Um, we still don't know what happened in this last in this last election. Um, you know, we're all fixated with Facebook, but you know, some of the most interesting stuff is now happening on on WhatsApp groups, which are even more closed than Facebook. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to understand what's going on. Um, and, you know, and so that builds a very non-ideological, a very kind of personality-based and feelings-based and not on a kind of sensible arguments-based sort of politics. So that's one aspect. But, but there's other things as well which I think are very important. I mean, the sort of speech and behavior that's rewarded online, so that gets more likes and shares, is one that plays in sort of group identity, sort of the logic of Social media, and it wasn't the internet to start off with, it's the social media mm -hmm. logic, okay. is one that in encourages taking more and more extreme positions, more and more radicalized positions. Uh, that's what just gets you more likes and shares. We see it all the time. The most polarizing material, which builds strong in-out group identities, um, is the one that does best. Uh, due to group polarization theory, I think there's been lots of sort of theorizing about why this happens from before the internet. That's just how people behave in groups. Yeah. Um, so that already pushes towards a more polarized politics, uh, more polarized language, um, towards what we know as, think of as populism. Um, so, you know, we, you could say that a lot of our kind of current politics, the polarization, the what's known as populism, the um, fuzzy, emotional, often angry center, and lack of detail um, is, is, uh, is all a product of the technology. I mean, I don't fully agree with that. 
but but definitely there's a, there's a strong case to be made that it plays a very very large part. And you know, two thousand six, you know, the moment social media and and smartphones become ubiquitous is also a moment of where well, there's yeah. a tipping point, and also the countries that are super digitized have more of it. So, you know, America, Britain, you know, the Philippines, these are all highly digitized society. Germany, which is going more slowly towards this place, is, has, 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 is, is much less so, yeah. and has much less use of yeah. social media for political stuff, and absolutely no, and virtually no Twitter to speak of. Yeah, so that it, it seems to me then, uh, what you're saying is that sort of, now we are in danger that sort of the whole concept or concepts of truth and objectivity disappear. In the past, governments may have lied to us, but at least you know, we suspected that they were lying, or that we knew that they were lying, and we wanted them to tell the truth, and we cared about the truth. Then you get this sort of, uh, sort of postmodern kind of in-between phase. You write about it, or you, you hint at this in the book, uh, where um, you know, people say you know, where objectivity is deconstructed into uh, a whole range of sort of subjectivities, like objectivity is really just male subjectivity, or objectivity is really just Western imperialism. And now, with the rise of social media, that is taken one step further, because now, as you say, the the um, uh, the, the messages uh, that uh, and the news in inverted commas that's being put forward and that is watched most and that gets the most c clicks is when it's the most extreme and when it's it's almost like you know people uh, the messages become advertisements. They so the the subjectivity itself becomes almost like an advertisement or a kind of self advertisement. And the more extreme that is, the more likes you get, the more clicks you get, uh, and so on. So that even the, the so the notion of subjectivity almost uh, almost disappears. Uh, and um, you know there's there's no way back to the the truth. Maybe let's explore this. Uh, point about populism a, a bit more. In uh, This Is Not Propaganda, you write about populism as a strategy. Can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, so listen, there's a big literature out there about sort of what is populism, and I, I don't want to kind of compete with that or, or get into these kind of like strident debates among political scientists. So I'm really talking about this from the point of view of the spin doctor. Um, and, and that's what I look at. So I'm looking at the people who construct an idea of the people, whether in campaigns, and then I look at Islamism as well, in, in, in terms of political Islamism. And, and it's strikingly similar. So they're all dealing with a landscape where old ideologies have gone, where left and right aren't really operating systems anymore that are of any great use. We talked about that at the beginning yeah, of the interview, yeah. so the demise of clear and convincing ideas. Which, which I think we saw already very clearly in Russia in the early 1990s. Yes. Uh, and so their the need is to put together new political identities. So not identity politics in the American sense, but your goal is to construct new political identities, which is done around the idea of, of constructing the Ummah, the people, and so on. And, and you see people who think about these things really coming to this from very different places. You see Islamists coming to it from, from their own place. Uh, and actually, we're talking Sheffield, and my, my, my hero, who's the a kind of a reformed political Islamist is, is one who comes from, from Sheffield. Uh, but really talking about very similar things to what the guy who was Putin's spin doc talks about, the sort of wasteland where these young people don't feel any loyalty to England and feel very lost. There's no left or right anymore. So he's in the 90s as well. And so political Islam comes in and gives a new sense of identity and, and, uh, and community and, and an idea of, of, of the people, which remarkably echoes what you know, spin doctors in Russia are talking about in the 1990s. And of course, at the same time, you do have some political theories, especially on the left, talking about as populism as a strategy. So mm -hmm. Mouffe and Laclau, who are these kind of pioneering thinkers about populism coming in from, from a left perspective, who are now incredibly fashionable amongst some of, were very fashionable among some, some of the Corbyn groups, but Podemos definitely, and, and maybe partly in America as well, I don't know. Um, so you have leftist thinkers going, okay, actually the old left and right thing doesn't work, we can't be pure Marxist anymore, we have to have other ways of putting together the people versus the financial elites, the government, the establishment, and stuff like that. So, so you have all these people coming from different directions, all kind of coming to the same conclusions. Um, and we're talking really about, about, about sort of strategies. So, so um, uh, I'm not 
really looking at populism as as sort of some sort of sustainable ideology. I'm looking at this what I call pop up populism, sure. and it can be and it's constantly moving around. It was very interesting looking at Brexit and then the 2017 election that I covered. Was it 17? Yeah, the 2017 election where you know you had one idea of the people morphing into the idea of the many. Uh, which works a little bit for, for the Corbyn people for, for a short while. Yeah, the slogan, for the many, not the few. Exactly, and it worked very well because that many included so many different groups. Uh, and it worked as long as it was amorphous. The moment it tried to be ideological, it collapsed entirely. And the moment they started ignoring the polling, it collapsed entirely. This, for this to work, you have to be very audience-driven. You have to be constantly listening. What are the desires? What are the grievances in society? And it's your job to sort of tie them together. Um, which I think enough people within the Tory campaign machine worked out. Um, I remember talking to a friend of mine who was very proud of a New Statesman cover, um, I don't remember, it was a couple of months ago, uh, about how the Tory party sort of showed a picture of sort of like Churchill, Thatcher, Cameron, and then Johnson at the bottom, and each getting smaller, uh, kind of showing how Tory ideology had shrunk, and how it used to be a, you know, a whole set of ideas and it just become Johnson. And, I was, and, and this was meant as an insult, and I remember telling my friend, he, I think, he works in a magazine. I was like, you've got this completely the wrong way around. They're going to be successful because they have no ideology. You know, this is their strength. They worked out, especially sort of the people who run their campaigns have worked out that ideologically will yeah. kill you. So the idea being that populism, yeah. tell me if I'm wrong, the idea being that populism is, is almost like kind of an empty shell which uh, conjures up or evokes things such as the people or the folk as the Nazis did. Uh, or Britain or America, you know, make America great, great again, and so on. So that all these disparate people, mm. you want to unite, unite them in some way, mm. but you don't really have a clear ideology anymore. So you gather them together under this rather vague banner. That, that's the idea. Yeah, and it falls it? apart again. So it's really interesting to, and, and you have to recreate it for every election. So Das Volk, I think, was probably a little bit more steadier. That there were so many echoes between now and the 1930s. But it feels something a little more stable because it, it, it's racial, you know. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, that there is kind of a line there that they're talking about. Well, here I think you have to be even more, even more supple than that. I mean, Trump, without a doubt, has sort of well gone way beyond dog whistling to ethnic nationalists. But if you listen to his speeches now, you know, black people love me, Hispanics love me. He can, you know, he can put on that face as well. You know, he can go and hang out with Kanye West. Yeah. So that, I mean, you know, if, if he feels he needs that two percent yeah. of voters. But, but I've always thought that that's an interesting parallel, actually, with National Socialism, because Hitler also was very good at... So he would talk to the workers, yeah. uh, or before he came to power, he would talk, or, or, or talk about workers' powers and, you know, how f f uh, uh, capitalism was bad and financial capitalism was even worse uh, and, and so on. But then the moment he realised, OK, now I really need the support of big business, then he would sort of turn that off, and then he would talk to them in a, in a, in a, very, in a very different way. So the, the kind of hopping, as it were, jumping from target group to target group, it's, which is something that, hit, that Hitler did. And Trump is doing kind of doing the same thing, precisely because now I need the bl black people, or now I need gay people, so I'm going to say that, you know, maybe I, would, I Donald Trump would vote for a gay candidate uh, as, uh, 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 as well. And that kind of maybe links into what we were talking about earlier, which is sort of people's, I don't know, cynicism or lack of ideology, that they're actually then you know, they go from moment to moment, and at different moments, they're willing to buy in to different ideological or semi-ideological offers. I mean, I still think there's, I mean, I think there does seem to be a red line for Hitler when it came to, 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 to certain sort of ethnicities and certain ideas of the race. But, oh, Hitler um, was very good, for example, when he organised the uh, Berlin Olympics in 1936. Yeah. And he made sure that all the anti-Jewish posters went and there was no anti-Jewish propaganda any, anymore. But you're right, he still believed in this very, very firmly. And of course, that then yeah. eventually led to, led to the Holocaust. But, 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 but there are many, many similarities, I mean, uh, which go very deep, I think. Uh, even before we get to the propaganda and rhetorical strategy, um, in Hannah Arendt, when she talks about the origins of totalitarianism, she talks about how both in Russia, in the sort of tens and early 20s, and in Germany, post First World War, you have a collapse of stable social identities, um, different classes. And in that collapse of social identities, what she calls creating the masses becomes the number one mission of the leadership. Uh, yeah, the, and your, thinks, your title, yeah. Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, is, is an allusion to Hannah Arendt, of the bit in Hannah Arendt in The Origins of Totalitarianism. Yeah. Actually, unconsciously, I was actually thinking of Dostoevsky, but there you go. Uh, 
I, I think I may well have read Aaron's at university and it kind of stood and it sort of sat there somewhere. But it wasn't a conscious quote, which just shows how, actually shows even more how similar it is, because uh, I wasn't making a conscious parallel with her. Uh, but yes, it was later pointed out to me, and I, I obviously it was a text that I would have covered at, uh, at university. But, um, um, but going back and rereading it was so interesting, was, was this is exactly what sociologists and, and, and spin doctors tell me now. So talking about Britain, for example, um, uh, it's not all in the book, but I've done it a lot for separate sort of articles and, 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 and various uh, radio programs. Uh, I've talked to a lot of pollsters and sociologists, and it used to be very easy for them to define the different social categories. You know, you see left, right, working class, you know, a bit of regional. Uh, then in the 90s, it got harder, because society was starting to move around a little bit, and so you had these things like Worcester Woman, Mondeo Man, trying mm, to define mm, people mm. by their desires for commercial goods, which kind of was our life in the 1990s, you know. Uh, life as life sort of uh, unfettered, joyful capitalism. Uh, but that doesn't really define who you vote for anymore either. You know, you have, I mean, you know, that, that's broken as well. You can have, the fact that someone's a Mondeo Man really doesn't mean are they Brexit or Remain. Mm. Uh, and so the so social categories have gone um, and, and there's this, just this endless search. Is it psychographic categories? Is it psychological ones? Is it, um, you know, I've been inside of various kind of like uh, polling agencies and they're trying to build these kind of complex models of how you identify somebody in society. Um, then another the very simple one is social media groups. At least you've got somebody there in a social media group and you know that they are then defined by the fact that they're into animal rights or into, you know, white chocolate or something. It could be something tiny or they're left-handers. Uh, so, the, but there's this endless search on, oh my God, how do we define people? Which, which I think is very, very, um, which echoes what Aaron's talking about. I mean, ours has happened not through a crisis, um, but through, you know, various uh, technological and social and economic changes. And of course, companies are trying to find out about this mm. by analyzing internet data. So you talk yeah. about this yeah. uh, in the book, Cambridge Analytica, yeah. so on how they try and get a picture of people. So how do we, pitch our ideas or how do we sell our candidate mm -hmm. to this person, that person, that person. And then you, you do internet search and you look at how, there, you look at people's internet searches and internet behavior. To the extent you can do that, I'm very skeptical about Cambridge Analytica's claims. I mean, for those of watching this who don't know it, they're a company that worked on the Trump campaign and then were associated with the Brexit campaign. They didn't officially work on it. Um, but, but they made huge claims about being able to basically essentially mind read people from their likes and shares online and yeah. other bits of data that we leave. Um, so actually in my book, I interview the guy who set up the company that they are a spin-off from, which is something called SCL. And he's a genuine obsessive with what makes people tick. And he's something he's been doing for decades. Uh, his name's Nigel Oakes. And, and kind of worked with the defense industries, uh, well, industries with, with defense, uh, a little bit with, with sort of with, with, with political campaigns and social campaigns. So doing everything from trying to get people to use uh, condoms to stop the spread of AIDS and, and anti-smoking campaigns through to working for some, some you know, rather, um, uh, I was gonna say malodorous uh, uh, political movements across the world, uh, through to doing bits and bobs with, with, with defense. Um, but he, whatever his, Whatever you think of him is a genuine obsessive. Uh, he spent decades finding out what actually drives behavioral change. And he's quite genuine in that. And I've spoken to a lot of people who work with him um, across the decades. And, and everyone admits that he's tried very hard to find that key of human behavior. Now, he describes himself as amoral. So you can use that key for good or bad. You can use it to create ISIS or elect a right-wing populist or, or get people to stop smoking. It's re his thing is like, I have found the key. You can use it anyway. But Cambridge Analytica was a spin-off from that company. Uh, and he was very skeptical of their claims that you could do that sort of social research yeah. online at the moment. Maybe in the future, we'll know more about people online. But he felt that they were slightly, ever so slightly um, selling themselves, which again is the I was, story. I was going to say that, the that story there's, an, there's an interesting paradox <laughs> yeah. there, which you actually address in the book when you say, when people say they look at all the, these companies uh, and bots and cyborgs and all the rest of it, and they say, oh my gosh, this is incredibly dangerous, yeah. then 
precisely the fact that you're saying that, maybe in a sense the fact that they're kind of found out in inverted commas, makes them even more dangerous because that people then think, oh my gosh, all these things they can do, mm. and maybe actually they aren't that powerful. However, final question. Um, if this is the situation we're in, let's ask the Lenin question, what is to be done? I mean, do we need to do anything? Can we do anything? Mm. So well, the, I have set up a, whole, a small research institute at, at a uh, research initiative, to be precise, at the LSC that looks at this, and we're, we're going to be moving to Johns Hopkins from next year. So that's what we set up to do, and, and, and we try to track these new forms of campaign, uh, working with other people, uh, just to see how they're developing, because they develop all the time. I mean, um, you know, the sort of the American campaign, the Russian campaign in America from 2016 is probably impossible now, uh, due to sort of much stricter enforcement um, by, by the social media companies. So it's constantly evolving. But having said that, there is actually kind of like consistency that we see from country to country, which I look at in my book, and from medium to medium. Uh, and they're always aimed at spreading hatred, division, polarization to the point where democratic discourse and trust breaks down. And that doesn't matter whether they're doing that domestically. You know, if I look at Serbia, I look at Russia, I look at places in Latin America and South Asia, that's always the aim. It's not hegemonic control, it's you know, it spreads so much disinformation that people stop trusting each other, break down that kind of, you mentioned Habermas, that hope for a deliberative one nation debate. That's mm -hmm. always the aim. Um, and very similar technologies are used, but also very similar rhetoric, so conspiracy theories, us and them rhetoric and stuff like that. So really we have to think about two things. I think about reg in terms of regulation, how do we clean up this mess? And I don't think that's, I think we're moving towards that very fast. So there's an online harms bill that has come out in Britain, uh, which is gonna be going through parliament very soon. There's the EU audiovisual directive that's coming out. That's all gonna be big steps in trying to regulate this. And I think that has all to be about empowering the individual to understand how the information environment around them is, is, is shaped. So I think this kind of covert activity of bots and trolls and cyborgs, I think it should be made illegal. I, I don't think you should be able to do this kind of covert campaign. You can do any kind of campaign, but it has, you have to know who's behind it and, and um, whether what we're seeing online is organic or, or, or a person. Anonymity is fine, that's not the problem. It's a sort of mass coordinated inauthentic campaigns. When it comes to targeting, I think targeting in and of itself is fine. I think we just have to know who's behind the targeting. And if you see one ad from a campaign, you have to know all their other ads at the same time. You know, so, so people can't do this kind of like one message over here and one yeah, message yeah. over here thing. So just a much more, tra more transparent information environment. I think we need public oversight of algorithms. So there's accountability about um, how they're run. So when you're on Facebook, why do you see one thing and not another? When you uh, are on Google and type something in and why it's giving you one thing and not the other. Public oversight of algorithms and maybe some stipulation that the way they curate their, their material is in line with public service, um, uh, public service values. So, you know, if you type in Syria, you don't just get like a pile of lies and disinformation and campaigns from various political forces, you'd actually get something that's curated. You sound quite optimistic that that will happen, don't you think? That, oh, yeah. We'll, that, that, that we'll, people, that we'll, there we'll are lots there. of people both sort yeah. of saying authentically and inauthentically, look, this is against free speech? So that isn't against free speech. So against free speech is trying to take down content. So I don't think we can do much about that. If the content's not illegal, as in like it's not child porn or terrorism or you know, yeah, murder. Yeah, so you could then still have the lies about Syria. Yeah, yeah, but it'll be sort of curated, you'll have a mix of material, it wouldn't be games, because at the moment it's gamed. Um, so but the free speech piling. person would say, well, this does sound a little bit worrying, so, oh, there's free speech, we're just going to curate it. No, but we, we'll have oversight of it, so it'll be publicly how it's curated, so we'd know. At the moment, it's, it's in a black box. We, we meaning? Society. We'd have public oversight, we'd have a regulator that opens up the companies and say, how are you doing this, what are the values, what are the, what are the results of it? So we'd have public oversight. So that person could go, well, I don't like the way this is being curated and I'm gonna go and set up my own search engine. I mean, that, that's fine. Um, the point is we have to have a, there has to be enough openness about us to even to make that judgment. So at the moment, um, you know, you have the, 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 the Donald Trump team saying that 2020 elections are already rigged because Google is pushing liberal news up and conservative down. And the simple fact is we don't know. We have to have oversight of this. So Google already say that they curate stuff in line of public service stuff, but we don't know. 
You know, they already say they will prioritize reliable sources. We don't know what they mean by reliable sources. We don't know how it's done. So at the moment, we're in that space where people can go, it's all being manipulated. So that has to be torn open. You know, these are, at the end of the day, private companies. They can organize things as they want. But, uh, um, you know, uh, then we'll know how they're organizing. So, so that's, that's what needs to change in terms of regulation. No, I, I think in terms of taking content down, I think that's virtually impossible. And sadly, a lot of the regulation has gone towards that. You know, let's take down lies. It's just like, what, what, who's defining the lie? You know, what is, you know, where's the transparency around the takedowns? So no, I think that's impossible. I think, I think there's gonna be a lot of, if people choose to be Nazis, that's kind of up to them, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, the main thing is we need a, an information environment where there's enough understanding about what's moving through it and, and, and how it's moving in order to be able to respond. I mean, once we know, you know, who's, t who's behind the disinformation, where it's being targeted, we can respond to it. And presumably yeah. also educating people as to, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is one of the reasons you're writing the book, it's just educating people as to what's actually going on and what they've got to watch out for. Yeah, but I mean, I'm very, I'm very worried about that because I don't want to, uh, in the sense that there's a danger with that kind of education just leads to sort of even more cynicism <laughs> and even more lack of trust. So the education we need is one that has kind of trust building and dialogue built into it. Um, and there are much cleverer people than I who think about it. How do you teach people to be critical without them becoming cynical is, is the tough bit. I don't think you can be critical about something which is a black box. The internet has to be interpretable for us to be able to have any kind of criticism. Cr to critique it. At the moment, it's just a black box, which I think that, same, that people, feeds the cynicism. People still have to do the critiquing. So yeah, I call yeah, you I'm an, not saying, I'm not saying an we old enlightenment yeah. person, if you will. But I'm I think not, without, not, without some sort of education yeah. of people, you know, you can offer them as much openness if you want to. I mean, yeah. at the moment, it's already possible. You just, you know, you can watch different channels. You know, watch CNN, Fox, RT, and do yeah. some comparing. You can read newspapers as well as just doing on, you know, yeah. uh, uh, the Washington Post or whatever. Uh, and lots of people aren't doing it. Yeah. And that's where I get to the next point, which is I think we need kind of a, a, new, a new generation of media whose job it is to reach alienated audiences and whose job is to create that kind of plural and full and fair and free, but actually at the end of the day sort of like coherent and common discourse which used to be, we thought would just happen a priori if we just had a bunch of pluralistic media and we could compare them, or we had a public service media that united the different groups in society. That whole model kind of worked when you had a very limited amount of media. It doesn't work in the new age. So I think we need a new, a new iteration of media that gets up in the morning thinking not how I rile up my own side, which even quality media does as an editorially quality media. We see this in America where, you know, I'm not, making a qualitative comparison between Fox and, let's say, MSNBC. But without a doubt, MSNBC is trying to rile up their own supporters. It's still very, very tribal. And it's all, it still plays into this us and them kind of logic. So we need media that get up in the morning, especially in the digital space, and go, OK, not how do I get likes and shares the easiest, which is being as partisan as possible, but how do I reach the other side? Or actually, how much do I know about the other side? Are they that other side -y? which is still the kind of the spirit that something like the BBC was created in, but the BBC still thinks in a very broadcast model. So digital model is just slightly different, uh, which probably be mean prioritizing effects over content in the sense that it's by thinking of the effect of what we're creating. Does that stimulate an evidence-driven civil conversation rather than trying to find the ideal balance within the program? You know, so it's, am I actually managed to get these two different types, sides of society to, to to, to think about this content in, in ways that are in line with these kind of public service attitudes. I mean, I don't think we can, you mentioned objectivity and truth. I don't think we can return to the idea of a sort of 7 p.m. Peter Sissons type of TV presenter sort of saying, this is the news, this is the truth, this, this is, is objectivity. The state of the world. This is objectivity. I mean, I think that's fallen apart for many, 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 many reasons. Uh, so I think we have, but I haven't let go of those ideals. So I think we have to think of them as types of conversation that we can generate. Um, and again, that's measurable. We can, we can, we can strive towards that. It, it does mean not making money off it, though. So it'll probably have to be fostered in some sort of non-commercial uh, model. 
Yeah, that, that'll be a very, very tough challenge in today's world, I think. I, I hope that'll happen. Yeah. I think in Britain it's feasible because we have that tradition. So the BBC was already a way of thinking about this stuff. Still, yes. Yeah, so, so yes, exactly. Um, so, so I think that's not inimical to, to, to British thinking. Certainly not, not inimical to sort of many European thinking where there's strong public broadcasters, like in Scandinavia. So I don't think, and then in Germany you have commercial media, but which ha feels a very strong public service responsibility. Um, and a very strong public... Uh, public broadcasters as well, of course. In yeah. So, so, so I think in Europe it's perfectly possible. Uh, it's just about creating, stimulating that, and supporting it. And no, I think I think I think that's not inimical to European thinking. The place where you hit the wall is America, because they still believe in wonderful metaphors like the marketplace of ideas, which is a metaphor which has sustained thinking about information and media, but which m just might not be true anymore. I mean, just the way it sort of turned out, surprise, surprise, that financial markets could really easily be rigged. Information markets can now be rigged to such an extent that it's completely unclear whether the marketplace model is particularly relevant anymore. Or that metaphor, it's not really a model, it's a metaphor, um, whether that metaphor is still coherent. But so much of this is, America is so important for so many reasons that if you can't convince America that they need some other approach, yeah. The rest of us suffer in a bad way. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that all this will, will happen. I have to say... There are people uh, who get it in America. I've met people who completely yeah. get it, but, but it's just a case of how, how do you push through this kind of mental block. Yeah. I think about 10, 15, 20 years ago, I, I thought that, you know, Habermas's idea of the public sphere was mm. sort of very idealistic. And, and now I think, actually, it's a really good concept that we need to work towards. I think, look, look, in terms of the academic thinking, we have to think again, what, where is the boundary between public and private? I mean, I still think that the ideals of what he's talking about, kind of, again, they're kind of implied in, in, in a lot of our political models, that we have evidence-based decision-making based on deliberative debate. I mean, it's kind of, you know, implied in so much of, of what we do, or that we have enough of it for us to have a certain, a certain model and a certain amount of consensus about things. So I think even if, without getting into the sort of the idealism of Habermas, a lot of that is built into what, what's, how our societies are meant to work. But again, I think there's a lot of going back to the drawing board. I mean, what is the boundary between the public and the private now? I mean, on social media, it's completely unclear. So there's some sort of new agreement that's, ne that's necessary. Um, how do we, in a way, we can define deliberative debate much more now on social media. We can, we can see the sort of the patterns of discourse on social media, um, whether they're always necessarily indicative of all of society is unclear. Sometimes, you know, people mistake Twitter for the real world. But still, we have much, we, in a way, we have much, much, much more uh, data to work with, which could be used for good. Um, let's, just, let's hope that that will happen, Peter. I'm, 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 I'm getting to, too optimistic I'm, for you. I'm, I'm, no, 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 not <laughs> at all. I, I just hope you're right. Um, Peter Pomerantz, thank, thank you very much for doing this interview.